Welcome back. Here's part three of our Sloan Digital Sky Survey Hubble Diagram Project. Um, this is the redshifts section. And again, redshifts is, is, there are way to figure out how fast a galaxy is moving away from us. Um, all of these terms you should be comfortable with. We've gone over all of these actually starting in the fall semester. Um, an angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer. So 100 nanometers is the same as 1,000 angstroms. It's just uh, another, um, another distance or length unit. Um, when we measure a redshift, we have to look at a spectrum, and we have to compare wavelengths that are shifted from where we expect them to be. So this is why um, the hydrogen uh, wavelengths, the Bomber series in particular, can be super important not just to find hydrogen, but as a tool for figuring out how fast something's moving. So hydrogen alpha, that's the energy level 3 to 2 drop in hydrogen, corresponds to a wavelength of 65, 62.8 angstroms. That's the same as 656.3 nanometers. Um, that's energy level, again, 3 to 2 that corresponds to red. Energy level 4 to 2 is that teal colored line that's at 486 nanometers or 4861.3 angstroms. Um, energy level 5 to 2, uh, bomber gamma or hydrogen gamma, is a violet color uh, that's 434 nanometers or 4340.5 angstroms. And then hydrogen delta or bomber delta, that's energy level 6 to 2, um, that's even shorter higher energy than the rest of these at 4101.7 angstroms or 410 nanometers. So when we look at a spectrum and we see spikes that we expect to line up and what we see here is a very big spike and then another spike that's a certain distance away. This is the same interval, sort of the same distance wavelength wise as hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta and they're labeled accordingly. Um, but basically, we're looking at what's the difference between 65, uh, 62.8 angstroms and 48, 61.3 angstroms. So that distance is the same, and we see that both are collectively shifted. Hydrogen alpha is not in the 6,000 angstroms. It's in the 7,000 angstroms. And hydrogen beta is in the 5,000s, not in the 4,000s as indicated here. So both lines have shifted by equal amounts. And so what that tells us is that there is a, a stretching. Everything is getting redder. So the observed wavelength over the rest wavelength of the object we're stationary relative, relative to us is equal to 1 plus z. And z is this redshift parameter. Notice there are no units on this. This is length divided by length. So z also has no units. It's just a ratio. Um, converting from redshift to velocity, we just multiply the speed of light times z. And so, because z has no units, c is in kilometers per second if we use this value for the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the fifth, or 300,000 kilometers per second, then v will also be in kilometers per second. Um, this is a ratio. It is a ratio of the speed of the galaxy to the speed of light. So, this is a a unitless uh, value z, but again, it just gives us a parameter that we can use to figure out how fast a galaxy appears to be moving. But if we had a really large redshift, um, yeah, this is accurate only for small values of z. A large redshift could imply that the object is moving away faster than the speed of light. But a better way to think about this, the cosmological interpretation, is that 1 plus z is the distance that the galaxy is um, at a particular time over the distance uh, that the galaxy is at um, now. So that's going to be a, a much bigger distance. So um, d0 or dz is the time we're observing now and then d0 is the distance the galaxy was at then. So this is a, um, a ratio of stretch of how big uh, the universe has gotten since the light left the galaxy. So um, question six in the Sky Server database, you can find redshifts for quasars, I'll get into what a quasar is in a second, um, such that z is greater than one. Is there a conceptual problem? Um, I don't know. Um, 
quasars are interesting objects. They are very, very distant. And so there is an awesome episode of Astronomy Cast all about quasars, if you want to know what they are. Um, and they, they mystified people when we first encountered them. Um, this article here from Nature uh, gives you a little picture of what a quasar is. I'll put these links in the, they're, they're going to be in the, um, the description of this video. But what a quasar is, is a supermassive black hole. We're talking millions of times the mass of our sun that has a disk of material, gas, dust, stars, um, all being uh, spiraled in uh, from the black hole's uh, gravity. They pass the point of no return and they're going to spiral in. And what happens is as all this matter spirals down this proverbial cosmic toilet, the, the temperatures heat up and all this material gives off all kinds of emission lines. So the first quasar ever discovered, when we first found it, we didn't think it was actually part of a galaxy. We called it a, it was like a point light source because it was so far away. So the first um, name for it was QSR, quasi-stellar, um, or QSO, quasi-stellar object. And then there was QSR, quasi-stellar radio source, because um, they give off a lot of radio waves too. And physicists and astronomers thought they were looking at some star uh, that had lines that had never been seen before. But they were, what they were really looking at was incredibly redshifted hydrogen lines because there's still a lot of hydrogen here giving off lines. And it was redshifted so far, they didn't realize how distant this object was. And the fact that it was as bright as it was and as distant as it was meant the thing was in like brighter than any known object in an absolute sense. And it's because of the sheer amount of material that's being accreted by a supermassive black hole. So what a quasar is, as we, as we think of it now, it's the supermassive black hole that's in the center of some galaxy that is actively feeding and giving off massive amounts of radiation as the stuff spirals in. So the conceptual problem is that these quasars are so far away that we have to use a different version of this velocity formula. But for the galaxies we'll be looking at, that's not going to be the case. Um, the next part, looking at um, redshifts for particular galaxies, so launching these redshifts here. And so we're looking at can we shift the galaxy and get redshifts and match them up if you have the, the right template because not every galaxy has the same kind of emissions. So you have to find one that kind of matches up. And there we go. It's not going to perfectly match up, but it kind of does. But again, we looked for a particular absorption and emission line, redshift 0.14. I'll go to another one. Um, i got to find a template that actually works with this. Again, these are all from models of galaxies. They could be spiral galaxies or elliptical galaxies. It just depends on um, what the what model we're, we're looking at. Um, this one might be a little hard to find. Uh, let's see. If I go through all of these, I may have. Um, nope, that's not it. Uh, I'm looking at this one and I'm seeing a couple lines here and then this little dip over here. So just because the intensity doesn't match, let's see if this works here. Nope, I don't think it's that one. This, I wonder if this one matches up. Um, yeah, I think this one is it because what I see here is this, this, and this dip here. So again, this process, this is the, the life of the spectroscopist trying to match up a bunch of squiggles with some other squiggles um, and say, well, this is where they match, and therefore the redshift is this. Um, if it seems kind of hand wavy, part of it kind of is. So there, there are some judgments to be made, and oftentimes papers get revised when we get better estimates. But this is how I would fit this one, again, looking for certain cues. Now, as we go down, we get some sample galaxy redshifts. Exercise 16 is look at these ones, which we already looked at. Um, it says um, 
we looked at uh, compare the redshifts found by the SDSS with the redshifts you calculated in exercise 13. Um, this is, I think, a typo. We're trying to compare the redshifts that you found in 15 using this template and uh, the templates and moving them back and forth to the redshifts that were actually found from the data table. So these redshifts that you found here. Um, another thing you can do, I just wanted to show how you can take an average selectively of cells in Excel. Um, if I wanted to average only the ones from exercise 16, I would select that. Actually, sorry, I have to start at the average function. And then I have to select this and then comma this holding the control um, button and then close parentheses. And then I have an average for those red shifts. So just a, a nice trick to use in Excel. Um, going back to the project page. So these, again, were these red shifts close to the ones that you got from exercise 15 from this red shifts um, little applet activity. Um, the last part of this exercise 17 is looking at a particular plate and I'm going to pick get a plate from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. There's other surveys you can get a plate from and these are all the spectra that are recorded by a single um, single plate in the Sloan Sky Survey. There are 640 fibers so essentially the Sloan Sky Survey can measure 640 spectra simultaneously. Not all are galaxies. Uh, you can see some are uh, stars. Here's a star, no redshift at all. Here is a quasi-stellar object, a quasar, high redshift. And then galaxies are all over the place. Um, but the trend that we will notice is that quasars tend to have higher redshift. There's one that's 3.7. Um, we can find all the QSOs here and see which, what kind of redshift they would be. Um, what I did was I went into a plate um, and then took column one and I just wrote down what were all of the galaxy redshifts that I found and then what were all of the quasar redshifts that I found. And then the next thing I did was I, I gave a range. And so for the galaxies, this one fell between 0 and 0.1. This one fell between 0 and 0.1, so on and so forth, until I got above 0.1. And the next range was 0.1 to 0.2. So this one fell in between 0.1 and 0.2, so on and so forth. And the highest redshift of a galaxy fell between 0.4 and 0.5. So this is called binning my data. You can get programs that will do this manu or automatically, but it's nice to do it manually sometimes. Um, under the quasars, I used the same bin sizes, uh, but they didn't have everything um, in terms of popping up in the data. Uh, but we had some pretty high ones as well. And then I collated the data to make a plot. And so I, uh, how many were in range of 0 to 0.1? There were 16 galaxies. How many in range 0.2 to 10? There are 0.2, 0.1 to 0.2. There were 10 galaxies, so on and so forth. And then I did the same uh, for a column for the quasars. And then I plotted the information here. And what I can see is that all the galaxies are really falling uh, within um, 0 to 0.5, but the quasars spread themselves out to pretty high redshifts. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean there's only galaxies at low redshifts. There's going to be galaxies at high redshifts. This means this is what the Sloan Sky Survey can actually see and get accurate reads on those galaxies. If they're further away, it's going to be a lot harder for the Sloan Sky Survey to read. Um, but quasars are bright enough so that at very high redshifts, the Sloan the Sky Survey can still pick them up. So that's really what this graph shows. It really just shows kind of a sampling bias of what the Sloan Digital Sky Survey can um, pick up. So it can pick up really bright quasars. Some of them can be very, very far away. Again, that core of a galaxy that has a black hole that's actively feeding makes one that is incredibly distant shine as bright as if it's relatively close. So that's a, uh, an interesting um, note on quasars. But again, bigger picture here, more important for like a scientific process, is this is showing us a 
a sampling bias. Our Sloan Digital Sky Survey picks up galaxies within this redshift, but it'll pick up quasars in there as well. So we just won't count quasars when we're trying to make a Hubble diagram. So going last return to the project page here, um, that is exercise 17. So this whole section is about redshifts and the nuance of redshifts and really getting um, at what the redshift data can tell us. Um, one more video to go.